Welcome to episode 82 of the Run Tales podcast, sponsored by Cheer Charge. Cheer Charge have been fueling adventures, mine and Gary's, every day, every day, every moment, with real food made with real ingredients since 2012. Go and check them out at cheercharge.co.uk. This week, if you spend over £35, you get a free tub of peanut butter. We also have an exciting competition coming up. We can also win free tubs of peanut butter. Have you ever tried their peanut butter, Gary? I have, yes. Uh, oh, my goodness. They used to do, I'm not too sure if they still do, but they did used to do a coconut one too. Uh, I was just going to say, do you remember that one? Oh, that was my favourite. That was my favourite. Uh, um, dangerous. Yeah. It's a dangerous tub to have in your household. I mean, yesterday I was doing something terrible with peanut butter. <laughs> oh. <Don't eat>. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting that idea. <laughs> I was just going to say, don't turn the volume down. It wasn't, it wasn't that sort of day. <laughs> Different podcast. I cut my little, littlest one loves her sandwiches without the cross off, cross without the cross on. And her dad refuses to cut the cross off, but I always do because I'm a sucker. Anyway, then I got the crust off the sandwich and I was dipping them in the peanut butter and then eating them. And I was like, oh, that's not nice, is it? <laughs> I was like looking around going, <laughs> <laughs> not a proud parenting moment. Why don't you just make a sandwich? Anyway, more about peanut butter later on in the show. How are you? <clears throat> I am. Um, How's the knee? Shall I ask for all uh, your girlfriend oh, fans? Me. Oh, Gary. Oh, Gary. <laughs> Gary, your poor knee. Oh, my God. He's not whining about it. Just get I on with it. I am used to this. I have three sisters, so I'm quite used <laughs> to it. Uh, being fussed uh yeah you know i'm happy to report the knee is definitely going the right direction um it's such a good time for me that eh, i've got nothing planned i think all of the commitments i had we chatted about this off air about the cross country the bob graham round and then the howard hobble they're all done and dusted now so for the next two weeks it is going to be it's like a bit of hiking and a bit of jogging when i'm out filming a lot of cycling and dog walking so nothing really too strenuous and um yeah you know it feels all right um I uh, really do appreciate all the concern out there. <laughs> and I don't know what it is about myself. I'm being a bit stubborn about it, but I just think I'm, what, what, I have had a problem with the knee in the past and I'm doing exactly what the physio um, told me to do then. And what Brody mentioned, find what you can tolerate and uh, do strength and exercises, keep movement. And um, that's the way I'm going. And I will say if when I do start training and it is, it just aggravates it straight away, then yes, hundred percent. It's a bit more serious than I thought it was. I'll start uh, seeking advice, but yeah, so that's good. That's like, you know, I did over the weekend, I did two big days or Friday. Yeah, so when I'll, he says it's not running people, if you check him out in the Strava, he's a lying toe rag. Yeah. Tell us what he's doing. <laughs> yeah. But you must have seen the splits. They were like 20 odd. 30 no, miles. frankly, I haven't. I don't spend my time. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, you don't check my splits out. I'm disappointed. <laughs> um, yeah. It, when I was over the lakes, it was a mix. It was probably predominantly walking. Um, and then a bit of jogging in between. But yeah, I was looking on the Friday, I went over to the friend and I filmed the Adidas Terex 25K route, which is part of the Keswick Mountain Festival. And if anyone hasn't been to the Keswick Mountain Festival, it's quite a wonderful experience for outdoorsy people and to be located in Keswick. It's quite a good hub for your outdoor activities. But what was really wicked, um, I just thought, yeah, I'll do this uh, route, film it. It's got some value for people out there um, who might be considering doing one of the events. And, but it stays quite low. Basically, you wrap around Oldswater, but you go a bit further down to uh, Rostwaite. And normally when I've been to the lakes in the past, here, I never go to the lake itself. I never go down to uh, Derwent Water. I just <laughs> kind of... Don't go down to sea level. Yeah, yeah. I just go up to Skido <laughs> or something straight away or over to uh, Robinson or that, that direction. Um, so that was quite unique. But and also staying quite low, the trails around the lake, a completely different run and um, quite technical underfoot in places. But just beautiful really and the day on friday my goodness me it was just absolutely glorious in the uk so i enjoyed that and then on sunday there was a lakeland hundred recce and a friend from the village was going so i just jumped in with him and he dropped me off at pooley bridge at seven o'clock in the morning then i spent the day where yeah, we left wingate it's uh 5 30 i think oh. yeah, so early, early start so I, but then yeah dropped me off there and i spent the day 
Wainwright bag in. So I did quite a few Wainwrights that day. I just thought, we've, all the guests that we've had on, you know, Steve Birkinshaw, Russ Mohouse. I thought, wow, well, I'm missing out on something here. Yeah. And um, that's my little... Any one. memorable ones? Well, I've done it before, but um, Arthur's Pike is uh, such a lovely view down over Ullswater. And then uh, Holland Fell too, which is... You know, if you wanted quite a simple day out with your family, you could go and park up at uh, Martindale and uh, just a little out and back to Paul and Phil. It's, again, not really high. Uh, I always say things like that, and then it's not really fair for me to say that's not high because for somebody that might be like, Gary, set me up big time here. This is a, <laughs> this is horrendous. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's quite a, a, an okay walk. Um, but I would get there early. My goodness, I was there at 10.30 and the car park was chock block So if you're going to do it. Especially on a, on a beautiful day. Beautiful day. But, um, yeah, it was nice. And at the end of the run, I just sat down there and uh, we talk about this quite often where you just be mindful and in that moment and be present. And I just sat there at the end of the run um, overlooking Ull's Water, scoffing my Chia Charge bar, just taking a moment. And it was just like, this is amazing. Just uh, just beautiful. But um, from an exercise point of view, walking, on the bike, strength and conditioning. And I think that is that. But I do need to give, sorry, I don't want to forget about this. Neil, my friend, he uh, pointed out the he got he got a bit of intel on the girl who gave us the uh shout the secret the secret top tip yeah the secret on the Howard Hubble and it's mm. a girl called Charlotte and she is a quite a good athlete from from what I hear she was representing West Yorkshire in the national cross country XC last oh, awesome. weekend yeah. Yeah, so thanks, Charlotte, for the little nudge, and that was just perfectly timed bit of more. You owe her a cream egg or a packet of mini eggs. <laughs> I owe her a chair charge bar. You owe her a chair charge bar. <laughs> but apart from that, yeah, so it's been a really good week. Um, and what is really good, I've found that although I'm not really running, my endorphins are, you know, I'm getting the, I'm ticking the boxes as far as my, um, oh, you know, how my mental health or whatever it is. Mm. Um, I feel pretty good with with, with what I'm doing. I'm, I'm satisfied with the level of exercise. So, yeah, I'm pretty... Open. When will you start? When will you dip back into your into your training? Training is, uh, well, two weeks yesterday. So, although, yeah, so I've got two weeks of just mucking around, um, doing that kind Seems of stuff. Seems you've been mucking around for a long time, I think. Uh... Yeah, look, Lent update. Lent is going well, oh. too. I've not... I've not well, Gary, what did you say? What was your terminology in our dress rehearsal of this? Eddie, I'm smashing Lent. Smashing Lent. <laughs> and I said, I, I think that's what Eddie said <laughs> as well. <laughs> but yeah, it's, I'm, you know, it's still early days. Uh, but so far, but, you know, there's a massive caveat. Um, when I was seven hours on the fells, I had about yeah, oh, trigger charge I, bars and about yeah, seven yeah, yeah. Waffles. You've got you're like an you're like you're binging, you're binging, and then going it's absolutely fine because then you're at work and it's just a normal day and you're not running much, so you're not you're not hankering after. But I, anyway, 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 no, I take it all back. You're doing amazing, Gary. You're amazing. Otherwise, I'll get told off on Facebook with all your friends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, wow, well, I've gone on quite a lot there by myself. How are you? I was I was thinking of you on all those trails. You might notice this week my voice is a little deeper. And there's a bit, I'm trying not to um, hate, oh no, I've just done it. <laughs> I hate it on podcasts when you can hear bodily function. <laughs> So I got hit. The kids had this filthy cough. Oh my god! And they were coughing over me all week. And then, but like, like the rotating, wanting to sleep in the bed with me. And they'd be like, "Oh, I love you," but also try not to show up my face when I'm actually repulsed by them. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, "Oh my god!" Like, and I was like, Egh. especially as they get older, I'm like, get a tissue and put that in a tissue, and then they leave the children. tissue, and I'm like, oh. God. Anyway, I succumbed. I knew it was coming. I, I, and I also just dragged my ass around training last, the, like Monday to Friday, with uh, just a rotation. I was like this sort of like emergency sick ward here. I just had kids, uh, really proper. Like they were hallucinating. Oh, they were wow. so hot. They had this terrible fever, and it, it just went through the kids so that like. You know, I just had night after night of the next one. I'd be like, right, here we are in this process of this illness. So I, we were not having a ton of sleep. And obviously the worry, you know, I, I laugh about it, but obviously you are a bit like worried about the kids. And yeah. um, so, but I carried on, obviously trying to fit in all the training. So I'd be like out early in the morning <clears throat> and then 
I'd get on the treadmill at like seven, eight o'clock at night when they were all quiet. Right. And that I had to do my session. And I knew I was like, you're pressing that button. And yeah. that pressing that button of that go on the treadmill instead of resting is going, come on, Jim. Come on, come on. And so by Friday, so I, I had to move all like, no, I like to do my long runs during the week because our weekends are so busy. And then, so I'd save my long run. And then by Friday, I started thinking, oh, no, I don't feel well. And then Saturday, Friday, by Friday night, I couldn't, my, it was like, I was like, God, I feel so bad not giving the kids more sympathy. Um, <laughs> I was literally couldn't swallow. I couldn't talk. It was quite refreshing. I could and eat. Oh, Rin no. was like, what do you want for tea? I was like, oh, I couldn't eat that. Just tea. water. Um, tea, even tea was a bit... Um, so I had a liquid diet all the way. I just had to write off the training. You must have been like, exhausted of that accumulation of I lack of sleep. I was so tired. I think, like, not only got this this cold, then just is so tired. And um, but I have no problem. A couple of clients were like, Oh my god, I did it. I was like, well, well, I'm just not I'm gonna give myself a couple of days completely off and yeah. not quite and just rest, walk the dogs, and also because I couldn't eat because my throat was so sore. Actually, I didn't have any um there wasn't really much of a bargaining to be done to actually train because I was like just trying to survive. Obviously, as parents, you don't get like to lie in bed, uh, you have to just carry on. And so I just took the weekend off. Those little voices go, oh, my God, you know, this is the end of the year. If you miss a weekend of training, it doesn't make any difference. And um, so I started back again, but I mean, I'm under coach's orders and I will listen to coach's orders. So I'm keeping it all really easy. And actually, I feel pretty, I feel fine running like back eating. Yeah. But I feel pretty poor when I'm, there's no... There is no va va voom. It's literally dog jogs. I don't have any problem um, taking rest when I need it. Um, but but alongside that, you know, you know, we all know I stick to my training. Like I will do it until blood's coming from my eyeballs. But when I'm actually ill, and so I'm having a very, I'm trying to get the the running back in now, um, and uh, just nice and easy. And I'll just wait. I'm not. I haven't even looked at my plan this week because I don't want to push the plan. On I'm going to wait until I feel ready to do something and then I'll look and see what sort of fits best but it might be that this week is just some jogging around we are at uh, it's beautiful we've got beautiful weather frosty every morning but it means that the tracks of which still have snow on and they've stopped pisting them they're like ice um how can I describe it they are horrendous first thing in the morning which is my slot to run the dogs they're like oh, just like ice spikes. footprints that have just frozen they are and you're like Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> especially when you're a bit tired uh, you have a harness with the dog because that would be oh my god i'd be apps i'd be like you'll break your ankles they're, li they're like ankle breakers because there's nowhere so i'm like trying to pick yeah. tiny flap oh i could put my foot there so the running over the next few weeks i'm gonna have to do my long run i think on uh concrete again a bit later on in the week but Let's say by you know 12 o'clock is it melted? It's melted, but then that's almost worse because then it's just slush. Okay. So it's like hard pack, ankle breaking slush. So I, what I tend to do for the next couple of weeks, what I normally do is run on this hard stuff in the morning okay. and then I'll go on the road or I'll drive down and find a bit of trail. But then you put your trail trainers on and then you go around the corner and there's like a, an ice field. And you've only run 200 meters. It's a really tricky time to try running. I could put my skis on. I'll probably do that and stop winding. But um, so, yeah, feeling better, but uh, another little setback. I feel that this winter has been a constant, and I guess loads of people are probably feeling this. So that's how I'm like, don't panic. Mm. We had COVID at the start of the year. Then we've had various, like my kids have never missed a day off school. Yeah. And we've been in education for... 10 years now they've never missed you know the odd day for puking or something but this this few months we've been hit with some really bad germs bad really bad illnesses and uh so i was having a bit of a beat up about oh this winter's just been it wasn't like last winter but i guess every season's different and we just yeah. have to take what the good lord throws at us and do our best and rise as champions so i'm not going to be um disheartened by the fact that i haven't done probably i've done probably half the amount of skiing i did last winter yeah. i've done different running but it's just different it's going to be different there's nothing, it's not, there's, there's nothing it's and there's nothing i could do <laughs> 
but some yeah. people it would like um kind of choke them a bit i suppose maybe um i think i just gotta embrace i try and embrace stuff like that and uh and push on thank you to phil for sending in the uh, endurance life sussex results uh tip the if you haven't come across you probably wouldn't have gary um endurance life um i've done some of their races Oh, I'm so sorry. God, I doubted you. They do races all around the country. Tend to be like sort of coastal um, uh, regions, and they they nearly always offer 10k, half marathon, marathon, and an ultra. And they're and they're often like loops and figure of eights and stuff. So they're a great way to get started. Um, the t- courses tend to be hard really hard because Hmm. they're coastal so they tend to have a lot of elevation in but i think also like they're really friendly company so i think if you went to do like the ultra you can then do the marathon and go i'm done um uh but they always attract a good field really friendly the i had a look up at the results uh i saw neil kirby won the ultra in four hours 33 and alice Oh, let me get her surname right. Alice McGushin in four hours, 57. Neil Kirby, um, coming back from long-term um, injury, he is a super fast ultra runner, yeah. um, um, but suffered a bit with health problems last few years. So hopefully this is him on the way back up. But yeah, if you're looking for, they're really good training events. Um, have a look up at Endurance Life, loads and loads of races, but they do sell out quickly. I raced the, uh, oh, I've done it twice, the Bambra. I think they might call it the Northumberland Coast one. And yes, they do the 10, I think she said they do a 10K, uh, half, full, and then an ultra. And you're right, at the end, I did the marathon twice, so it was from Annick. So beautiful, literally, you could see the castle in the background. Oh. Like Harry Potter uh, <laughs> style, it was, it was awesome. And then you'd run to the coast, a little village called Almouth, which again is just a beautiful little coastal uh, village. Then you'd run up and you'd finish at Bamborough Castle. So... You know what I mean? The, the North Dumblin coastline, we do pretty good lining castles. Of it. it's, it's pretty good. <laughs> protecting, <laughs> your, protecting your borders. What a nice company to work for if that's if you work for Endurance Life and you get to move around all these different coastlines every few weeks. You're like, yeah. where are we going to next? But the Ultra, you get to Bambra and the marathon would finish, but then the Ultra yeah. wraps you around and you come back to yes. Bambra and say, oh, the courses do sometimes look a bit like, oh, we're just going to add a 10K in here. Off you go. Come to the finishing line and off you go again. Yeah. Good mental training, that, Gary. But then we did have the rescheduled goat. And um, it looks like they had a belter, but still knee deep in bogs, though. Uh, I bet you can't wait for that, Eddie. <laughs> It'll be dry. It'll be the dry bogs. when I get <laughs> well, Emma Stewart took the win for the ladies, uh, 11 hours and 35 minutes and 55 seconds. Awesome. And Simon Roberts took the overall win uh, at 10 hours, 44 minutes and uh, 13 seconds too. That was brilliant. Well done, everybody. This week, we were so lucky to have an amazing chat with Lizzie Hawker. Lizzie Hawker has been dubbed the Queen of the Mountains. She certainly is. She's the Queen of UTMB. Five wins at uh, UTMB. Uh, former world record holder for 24 hours. Winner of the 2006 uh, World 100K Championships. Winner at Spartathlon. That her CV goes on and on. While training for the UTMB, she spent a lot of her time uh, running on the trails of the Tour de Monte Rosa. And that, this led her to create a new race, which she tells us all about. Um, from Gracken to Zermatt, 93 miles through the villages of Italy and incorporates more than 32,000 feet of ascent and descent over technical terrain. We really enjoyed catching up with Lizzie. Here's our chat. welcome to the show where are you how are you and have you been for a run today i have been for a run today yeah it's it's beautiful i'm in switzerland at the moment um and it's spring is definitely coming very fast now so the snow's melting back and um you can start to smell the earth again it's it's beautiful Mm. yeah can you get on trails are you still on snow ice um half half Mm. and ice <laughs> so, what's so. your shoe choice on that just um, trainer. i tend to run in ultras just because i've got very wide feet um but here often carrying spikes at the moment just because yeah, you just you, never you know do you? you can start on like a lovely bit of trail and think i'm winning i found the trail and then you mm. go around 
I go up. Multi terrain at the moment. <laughs> you need you need some like go go gadget uh, little spikes that come out. I'm too scared. I haven't taken my spike. I've just got trainers with like tiny little micro spikes in them, and I'm going along the trail and the road going. Tick, 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 tick. <laughs> and I know all my neighbors are thinking she's such a loser, but I'm too scared still on the sheet ice. Uh, yeah. I feel a bit kind of strange asking this because it's such a, a massive journey um, to where you are today. But yeah, for any of our listeners, I can't imagine there's many out there, but if there is who don't know about your running journey, yeah, if you could share a bit about your journey into ultra running, that would be awesome. I guess it started quite late. Um, I fell into ultra running, I think when I was 29. Um, but by that point, I guess I'd had at least a decade of, running every day okay. simply for myself though not really racing um never thought of joining a club or anything it was it was simply i think I, f- I fell in love with the mountains as a child and so when i was back in the uk um running was just my way of being outside so that's that's kind of what it was and um sort of fell into the ultra world by chance really and then uh things <laughs> snowboard quite quickly um and yes it's it's led me to where i am today really um organizing a a race the ultra to montrosa and then exploring in the himalayas when i can so um it's been an interesting journey (laughs) i know you trained um i think i've read it uh was the is it on the uh, cambridge on the Mm. down by the river you did a lot of your training there but would you ever have done a like a, a tarmac race before you did UTMB or was UTMB your first official entry no I did I did um I think actually the London Marathon was the first race that I did back in the day just just um because my father had done it a few years earlier and, and coming from London that you just feel like you have to do it because it's the only time you see the, yeah. the streets without cars so um <laughs> But yeah, the same year as UTMB, I um, I did a track race in Barry in South Wales, forty miles okay. on the track, oh. just simply because I was going to see friends and they were doing it, and so I thought I'd do it as well. Um, but from that, I got selected to run for England at the Anglo Celtic hundred k race. Um, so. I think this was the March. It was, it was, um, I ran a hundred kilometers, um, on the road, which was interesting because between that track race and the hundred K, um, I went ski on a ski expedition in Turkey and actually had to leave early to get back, um, to Dublin in time for the race. So (laughs) it probably wasn't, uh, the conventional kind of preparation that most of the runners would have been doing. And I think that followed me on through the years. I did things a bit differently. Were you doing research or? No, no, it was, it, no, it was pleasure. But um, yeah, we were in the Akshirik mountains of the northeast of Turkey. Um, yeah, a totally remote area. Amazing. Um, it was beautiful. While you were doing that, thinking, oh, my God, I've got to go back and run laps. Like, <laughs> different worlds, different worlds. Yeah. But that, that theme sort of follows you throughout your career, the way that you train events, the way that you handle events. I love it. And I absolutely love the, the, the way that you wrote, write in your book. We follow your story through your first UTMB journey and it sort of dips in and out. And um, mm. I, I love, I know the UTMB route so well, so I love following you. You could picture exactly where you were. Um, so when you won your first UTMB, what was yeah. it like transitioning then from being, uh, from being a scientist, I guess, and, and then to overnight becoming this um, mini sensation and then an athlete? What was that period um, like? Well, it, it didn't happen immediately, I guess, because I'd just finished my PhD, which is why I kind of planned this trip in the Alps. And so straight from UTMB, I got the train back to the UK, to Cambridge, and started work at the British Antarctic Survey again, because um, I had worked there years previously. Um, so I <laughs> was kind of... <laughs> thrown into the the world of you know a new job and um actually becoming a science researcher yeah. um and all the while then i was i was thinking about running in in the back of my head so um 
it took a few years before I, I kind of came to the point where I realized I didn't actually want to be a, or wasn't cut out to be a career scientist and, um, and thought I'd just try and make it work living in the mountains. So um, sort of made made some changes. Well, what was your research? What, what, um... <laughs> oh, I was a physical oceanographer, so looking at kind of the 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 currents and the the salinity and um, and things, but working within the biological division. So it was kind of an ecosystem approach. Mm-hmm. Um, but my PhD was actually on data um, from the Nordic seas, so looking at the waters coming out of the Arctic and um, transitioning into the North Atlantic. Oh, so, um, do, you, do you ever dip back into that work now, Lizzie? No, it, it's difficult in in science simply because everything's the way the world works now. Everything's judged on um, your publication record. So, of course, if you're out of that system for some years, then it's hard to go back, but I'd I'd love the chance just to work on board ship again, and uh, um, yeah, really enjoyed being at sea. To what kind of duration? Would uh, be? Tended to be kind of two months at a time without touching land, yeah. and I added it up once. I've spent eighteen months of my life actually on board ship, <laughs> working. <laughs> How did you, did you, I trained um, somebody that trained for UTMB who worked on a ship and she did a lot of running on the treadmill. Did you have a treadmill? Did you run around the deck or was running not a big part of the? Um, No, running on the deck wasn't really a possibility. Usually we had um, kind of cargo tied down to the the back deck that we were taking down to the bases on the peninsula. Um, There was a small gym down in the bowels of the ship but it didn't have I don't even know what machine it was <laughs> it didn't have a running machine um and also being down in the bowels of the ship is the worst place to be if oh, you're being seasick so yeah. that came and went um and actually the last cruise I did a colleague and I bought the cheapest treadmill from Argos that we could find I think it was 60 quid <laughs> and literally had to bolt it to the deck um but yeah then you know if if, if the ship's doing this then oh my goodness I can't you're imagine. not really wanting to be outside <laughs> so all these people saying they can't get their training in you just find a way don't you <laughs> i did take a skipping rope on one one trip actually and and, and just skip the whole time just to do something outside <laughs> And during this period, um, maybe not when you're obviously on the on the research boards, but were you a coach athlete or did you um, self coach yourself? Um, I had some advice from Sarah Rao, um, sort of early on, uh, maybe two thousand six and seven. Um, but yeah, I, w- I wasn't really coached, and then after that, I just um, t- did my own thing. <laughs> What did your own thing look like, Lizzie? What was sort of, was you, were you a sort of like volume, Courtney DeWalter, as much hours as you can do? Or were you a bit more scientific in your approach? No, I wasn't scientific at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it would vary between the winter and, and the summer. So I guess in the winter time, it was usually more, more of a regular marathon type training. Um, but in the summertime, then the mileage could ramp up quite fast because I kind of probably raced a lot more than would be sensible simply because I enjoyed it. So in a way, the racing also became training. And if I was leading training camps for other people, like around the UTMB route or something, you know, then it's, it's, (laughs) your mileage kind of ramps up pretty fast. So, um, yeah, but just being out on the trails all day is what I love, love I doing. Love that. We've, so. had, we've heard that quite a bit, haven't we? Um, with different guests, just just big days out on the on the fells and the trails, not necessarily mm. specific, just um, time on feet. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Fast forward a bit, I suppose. Uh, I'm really interested in you. Obviously, you've got a love affair with Nepal, but what took you to Nepal, and was it like love at first sight? Um. It was, yeah, definitely. Um, 
but I first went in 2007 with Mark Hartel and Spike. We went to climb Amadablam and yeah. then run back from the wrist base camp to Kathmandu. So it was kind of a, a two objective um, trip. Yeah, and yeah, I love love the climbing and I love the journey. Um, not so much running on the road when we hit the road after jury, but, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I just love the whole thing. And then if we move forward again to the Great Himalayan Trail, from what I understand, it's not a formal um, route, say like some FKTs or something that we yeah. see. Yeah, but I suppose from yeah. from your point of view, what is it, and and yeah, why this route? Yeah, so uh, like like you were saying, it's it's not actually um, a long distance trail like the John Muir Trail or the Appalachian Trail in the US. That's kind of a fixed and way marked trail. Yeah. Um, it's it's simply kind of a network of local trails, really, um, crossing from all the Himal areas of of Nepal. And it really came about um, until, oh, now my dates. Um, it, it's only recently that the the kind of border region with Tibet has been demilitarized and yeah. um, kind of open for permit based trekking. So before that, um, like in the eighties, the Crane brothers ran across Nepal and. Um, Bruno Pori, a French guy and a friend of his, they also ran across Nepal, but they always had to skirt south of, of the, the, the northern okay. uh, mountain regions. So it was only once like permits were opened up that it was actually possible to, to cross. And um, Robin Boosted and Jamie McGuinness were talking about this idea. And fi finally, uh, Robin Boosted actually plotted out and... Um, kind of made this high level route the whole way across the country. Um, and I was doing, the thing is, because the, the, there is no one way. So I don't know how many people have, have kind of made a version of the GHT now, maybe 100, 150. And probably everybody's done something slightly different and also yeah. done it in a different style. So uh, what I wanted to do was just go fast and light. Um, and to cross, kind of make an independent crossing. So I was staying as high as I could, which meant as close to the Tibetan border as I could when there was a choice in routes, um, except for the glaciated regions so that I um, could stay independent and didn't have to yeah. um, have help in those regions. So that's kind of what guided my route choice, if you like. Yeah. And um, it's, it's, it's actually something I was thinking of way back in 2007, which is, um, you know, not even knowing that, that it existed. Um, just wanting a really long journey that stayed as high as possible in the mountains. So, <laughs> would it be a spectacular um, mix of terrain though? So sometimes it would be mountains and other times you'd be uh, maybe on glaciers or in jungles. Is that, was that? Yeah, yeah, to totally, yeah. Um, I, I, and I first tried it in 2011 and got lost in the jungle, uh, jungle section between Kanchenjunga and Makalu. Um, and when you say um, lost, though, were you? Was it was it days you were lost? Or? <laughs> yeah, I was. I was <laughs> in the forest for maybe four days. Oh, wow. um, but I also lost. <laughs> lost all my communications so I was out of communication for three nights um so by the time I did reach the village um on the other side of, of the river <laughs> uh, they were kind of starting to put a plan into place about how to come and find me or oh my find goodness. my body um so yeah it was it was quite an adventure and it's very rare in today's world that you're actually in a situation where you're totally alone and totally um like no communication at, yeah. at all so um kind of puts you in the position you have to totally rely on yourself to get you out of that, out did, of you, that did you feel vulnerable or were you completely just in the moment uh it's it's interesting i just had this complete certainty that i would be okay if i just took took my time um and i wasn't even worried about the animals um the wildlife it kind of felt like, well, I was I was using their their tracks for sure. Um, 
Okay. To, like <laughs> to make my way through this this thick jungle forest. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because in in actual fact, you know, had I fallen and twisted an ankle and not been able to move for a while, um, I would have run out of food quite simply yeah. because I was I was way off of the main trail and nobody would have been passing by. So, um, yeah, it was it was an interesting experience. My goodness me! <laughs> Sometimes I think with a big event and I can't compute anything as big as this, but. I don't process the whole 100 mile for argument's sake. It would be, say, checkpoint to checkpoint. Would that be how you'd approach something like this? Oh, definitely, yeah. Um, you, it, and also, it's just too big to think about as a whole. So um, literally just took it day by day, section by section. Um, and even to the point, you know, there was there was always some challenge, whether it was finding the way or, um, not knowing where I'd sleep or, um, you know, getting lost in another jungle yeah. forest or there's, there was always something every day. So it was, it was kind of, um, the, the, the kind of thing where, where actually when you're sitting, drinking a cup of tea, you just have to focus on that cup of tea and enjoy yeah. it because you don't know what the next moment's <laughs> going to bring kind of thing. And it's those moments that you need to keep yourself going through it. Yeah. So, um, Yeah. <laughs> And did you have a schedule or was it just actually, you know, you, I don't know, you'd, you'd make the most of daylight or you'd have to hit a certain yeah, point? No, I, I had no shed, schedule really, just um, wanting to travel as far as I could each each day. Um, and I generally, I mean, I wasn't moving fast, but I was just moving long distances every day. So I'd um, start with daylight and then keep going a couple of hours after dark normally. Um, just depending on where I was. And then that would be, <clears throat> I don't know, would you bivy just on, on, on the trail or if you hit a village, you'd... I tried mostly to stay in villages um, simply because actually having some warmth, just sitting by the fire and eating some food and um, having a night inside yeah, um, just keeps the... the <laughs> um, I don't know, when you, when you can look after yourself a bit, then you can keep going for, for longer. Um, but I did have some, um, both some unplanned and planned vivids outside. Um, I wasn't carrying a sleep, um, I wasn't carrying a tent or anything. I just had okay. my sleeping bag and a, like a foil bivy bag. And I did, um, pick up my stove when I crossed the Northern part of Dolpo, but also then had some vivids earlier on, um, without a stove so yeah and were these <clears throat> last one for me sorry eddie <laughs> how can i again <laughs> were these trails i'm just trying to visualize it would these be um like uh a network that the locals would use so for for, for, for that community at least that's how they would get from uh village to village so relative terms they're quite busy and well connected or were you pretty much remote uh, um Varied a lot. So in some places, yeah, for sure. It, 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 the normal trails that people would be using to get from one village to the next village. Um, in other places, I was higher in the mountains and more remote. And then in Dolpo had a section that would take be between the, like the last village in Dolpo and the, next, the village in the next region um, would normally take people sort of seven or eight days with horses. And I crossed that in 48 hours, and, but didn't see anybody the, the entire um, crossing. So, yeah, it varied a lot. How, did it, how was the language barrier? How did you explain yourself? Yeah, good, good question, because some villages were Nepali speaking, but some villages nobody even spoke Nepali. It was Tibetan only. Um, and I did always manage to make myself understood, but really really wished that my language skills were better because you know when you're you're sat with by the fire with um people from the village and you you just want to ask more questions or they they want you know have, have a proper conversation kind of thing so that's that's my one regret is that i couldn't um have a proper conversation with with people as, as i went it's funny you only, you only meet people for a very short period of time because yeah. then you're moving on but you know that intense kind of connection um was really special 
Maybe the connection was more intense without the language as well, though, because yeah. could be, yeah. She had a moment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no yeah. doubt, lots of highs and lows on that on the journey. Is there anything, yeah. any particular? I mean, the lows may might be the jungle, being <laughs> in the jungle. But any any particular highs or lows that really live with you and have sort of almost been life changing? I, I guess it's it's just the journey as a whole, the whole of the journey kind of thing. Um, and the connections with people that, that I made along the way and just the realization that you can make a journey like that, you know, a, a journey of a thousand miles under your own steam, um, just going by foot across you know, the highest, the highest mountains of the world. Um, it's, it's actually really special just to realize that's that's possible i actually did it twice the whole crossing 2016 and 17 yeah and i guess one of the worst moments was in 2016 i just crossed a 5000 meter pass and it had snowed so i had to um break trail and i hadn't really <laughs> i didn't put my sunglasses on stupidly obviously this was my next um, but you know i just didn't think about it so Across the pass and just above the village, um, some yak herders invited me to stop. So I, I spent the night there um, and woke up in the middle of the night in agony because I, I had really bad snow blindness. And I stayed in the yak herders' tent um, the whole of the next day and the next night. And then the day after that, finally managed just to walk down to the village. But it, I, I couldn't see enough even to get out of the tent to, to go to the toilet kind of thing. And they were burning juniper inside the tent. So, you know, for the, for the fire. So it was really, really smoky, which probably wasn't the best place to be, but they I couldn't, couldn't get myself anywhere They know else. what had happened to you. Oh, they could, they could see. Yeah. And, yeah. and they would, you know, um, they just looked after me and just, you know, they, they accepted that I needed to just to stay until I could move, um, which was quite incredible. But it, it was very remote because, you know, I'd just crossed a 5,000 meter pass. There are two um, almost 5,000 meter passes to the south or the jungle forest that I'd got lost in in 2011. Um, so it is a very remote place and probably not the best place to have got snow blind. But it was just time. I, I did recover enough. Is there any long-term effects of that? Um, no, I'm just not very kind to my eyes because I, I always forget to wear sunglasses. I always forget to give my kids sunglasses and I, I never forget mine because I've got really blue eyes and I think the snow, I can hardly see on a normal day without um, mm. sunglasses. And then when we were, we were, Gary and I were just talking about that snow blindness before we came on air and I was like, oh I, oh, I just sent one up skiing today and she hasn't got enough sunglasses again. Oh my God, they're all going to be snow blind. <laughs> I think it's lovely though that these villagers, these guys, you know, they they just saw you needed a bit of help and uh, yeah. took you in. The generosity of people is amazing. But, but the whole whole way through these journeys, and and now when I'm out ex exploring in in different places, um, I mean, it's humbling for us. Um, you know, just the thought that you can turn up in a village or you know to, to a little group of houses or something, and you, you will be fed and you will be given a place on the floor yeah. to sleep kind of thing. It's, it's something that's totally alien to our culture now, I think, yeah. to, to be that accepting of a stranger passing through. And in, in Nepal, because it's, it's still a country where people have to travel by foot um, very often, you know, they're in a village, they have to walk to the nearest road or, or something. So they're used to people traveling, um, yeah. And then if they needed to do the same, then they'd expect to be given shelter kind of thing. So, um, but it's totally humbling, the, yeah. the generosity of people. Yeah. I think we're kind of, especially in this Western world, it's kind of a bit of fear, isn't it? If somebody comes banging on your door at night, he'll ask him yeah. to help you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm su surprised I haven't got clubbered before now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's totally amazing. 
how did you keep pushing on? You know, it wasn't a race. It was completely self-imposed. When the chips were down, you couldn't see, for argument's sake. Uh, what made you What made you keep <laughs> getting open and going? Did you put berries? When you were... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a good question. I guess partly curiosity. Um, I mean, that's that's one of the things I love about crossing a pass is is just you know a new landscape opening up in front of you, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and actually just to kind of the privilege of seeing all these different mountain regions in Nepal. So obviously to do that, then I had to keep going. Yeah. Um, and also, I guess it's just what I love doing is moving all day on foot. So yeah. um, it is actually what I love doing, but it, yeah, it did strike me once like writing the story and, and going through photos afterwards. I just remember I'd, I'd just come down into this small town um, and it was, there was a strike on. So everywhere was shut and all I could get was um, like some hot tea and, and noodle soup. But these, these guys were just sitting there drinking a beer and it was a really, really hot day. Cause I was, I was down low then and had, had a big climb ahead. Um, and I was, afterwards i was thinking what what is it that you know it would have been so nice just to sit down <laughs> and uh and have a drink what what is it that made me keep going for hours yeah. and hours after that until i let myself stop um but yeah it, it's just what i love doing so i think sometimes do ultra runners because life is we've again we've chat about this quite often life's pretty comfortable for most of us i wonder if we do seek a bit of discomfort sometimes and that's maybe why we Oh, def definitely. I mean, I actually enjoy doing it without things. Um, and then you really appreciate it when you get back, you know, like hot water coming out of a tap and, um, and things like that. But I, I definitely, um, I, <laughs> at the moment I can only seem to go like five months or so before I need another dose of, <laughs> um, a good long spell out on the trail. So, um yeah it, i i enjoy doing without and then having the reminder of just how lucky we are um yeah. back in the everyday life kind of thing it's 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 so you know not many of us at all have the opportunity to be living in the presence here for 39 days but when you were coming to the end of it the journey was how did you feel were you looking forward to um you know say hot water maybe a, a pizza or a cup of coffee cup of tea um or were you kind of a bit anxious about reintegrating with regular life both um so you know there were things that i was really looking forward to like just having a hug from a friend or having a conversation with somebody or yeah. reading a book um but both times 2016 and 17 i had maybe two or three days back in Kathmandu and then went out on the Manaslu trail race. Um, I was usually marking the trails in the morning. So um, that was kind of my reintroduction <laughs> to, to the normal world, I guess. So it was like a halfway house. <laughs> People going, oh, I <laughs> So, yeah, it was. I was straight back into the mountains afterwards. Brilliant. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about um, what you're doing now? Um, I'll try not to say too much better. Um, you can tell us all a little bit about your what what your what you do now as your role um, and your uh, how it came about, how the race came about, and sort of where it is in its journey now. So. I'm the race director of Ultra Tour Monterosa, and how it came about is an interesting question. When I used to train for UTMB, I used to like to go and do the route um, a couple of times during the summer, like in two days back to back. And, and if I could do that, then I knew I was getting towards race fitness. Um, but then it got to the point where people knew me on the trails around Chamonix and it was kind of too busy. So um, I, I went back to kind of the Zermatt area, which is where I actually fell in love with the mountains as a child. And I realized that there was another 100 mile route, a long distance hiking route around Monterosa. 
Um, so I tried that and it took too much longer than 12 hour days because it's a much tougher route. How, um, how is it different to the UTMB? Because the UTMB trail is is a is a is described as a walker's trail, but it really is a walker's trail. I mean, there's very little technical, there's no technical skills really needed, is it? Is there just no. awareness that you're high in the mountains? Yeah. Um I mean the uh, the term on technical I well it depends what you define as technical. <laughs> I realize our, 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 because we both live in the mountains a bit when I just said that I thought that sounds so presumptuous, doesn't it? Because <laughs> <laughs> when I think technical then it you know um chemo or something where you're yeah. you know it's it's, it's, it's scrambling. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> um no it is just trails, but they're just more technical than utmb ones there's a, there's a lot more ascent and descent um yeah, it's about, it's about and 10, it's wilder <laughs> Ten thousand feet more about three thousand meters more climbing mm. than utmb yeah and and just much wilder um and i guess the the villages that you do pass through a, a, a small traditional valsa villages kind of thing um so when i was training there i was thinking if this was a race, this is the race that I'd actually want to come and do. Oh, okay. um, and but it, you know, it was just an idea in my head for years and years. And then um, later, uh, when I spent some time in Kathmandu, and was talking with my friend Richard, um, and finally he, he kind of kicked me into actually making it happen, um, rather than just continually talking about it so yeah. so that's kind of where it started um yeah and is there mul there's multiple races there's a the yeah. stage race and uh, different distances there is yeah um so we have the 170k ultra which is the full loop around monte rosa and then we have the same exactly the same route but as a four-day stage race and really um it's it's a way to share that route with some with like a group of runners that wouldn't yeah. necessarily ever want to do a, a hundred mile race um because it is so beautiful and so they can enjoy it all in daylight and you know eating a pizza in italy and, yeah. <laughs> sounds awesome <laughs> and things so um it's I, i'm really happy that we ha we have both um so different people can enjoy it and then we also have a 100k distance and now also a 60k and a small burglar. Um, but of course, everything has got a bit disrupted by COVID. So last year we had to keep everything within Switzerland and we couldn't make the full loop around. And now for this year, um, actually taking the stage race back on the full route and then 100k, 60k in Switzerland and the small burglar. So kind of... Um, slowly slowly getting back to the full set of races we hope for next year what time yeah, of year do you run this race is it it's the first weekend in september it's it's the always kind of the week after utmb and it's simply because you know earlier there's a very small window like optimal window for these kinds of races because earlier in the summer there could still be snow on the passes and it's it's just much better if it's if it's not but if you go too far into September, then of course it can snow, and when it's cold, then it can stay. So yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, kind yeah. of squeezed into the prime summertime. And when How does your build-up start for, for the race? Is it like literally as the, the that one finishes, you start again for the following year? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Except it goes quiet when I go off exploring in, <laughs> in the fall. Recent entries have gone a bit <laughs> quiet. Well, I just haven't confirmed because I've been. <laughs> how, have you, how have you found the job of being a race director, being on the other side of the uh, of the finish line? Um, love it. Hard, harder than ever running a race. Yeah, <laughs> but but challenging. I mean, it's it's interesting because you have to learn all kinds of things that you'd never thought about because you, you're kind of looking after every, every aspect of the race. Um, so. You know, there's there's bits that I enjoy more and bits that I'm less <laughs> less good at, like marketing. I'm hopeless at. Oh um, goodness me! So. <laughs> have you done, when you've done the whole lap? Have you timed yourself? Gone? I have actually got the FKT on this lap, uh, and this is this is a this is my time. Or have you never run it as a one loop? I have. Yeah, in 2016, I did it 
and I think I was, I actually can't remember, I was maybe 36 hours. And then we've had a woman run it in 35, but a different, a slightly different variation. Um, because the high level trail that I used to love between Grechen and, um, and Zermatt, part of that had a massive rockfall. Um, and so the, the whole, area is very unstable now with with climate change and the changing permafrost um so that trail is not usable anymore so you kind of have to go lower and then climb back up onto it later later down the valley um so slightly different variation yeah who was the lady that ran it in 35 hours um oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just gone julia bottiger Oh, okay. What year? When was that? 2000 and... um, 2018, I believe. How would you describe the race for people that are perhaps in England, perhaps, you know, they've had um, some experience in the Lake District, in the Scottish, uh, perhaps in the Highlands. Um, it's like this the sort of next step up um, in that sort of, or would you say if you've not had a good, a lot of trail experience, you could still come and have a go perhaps at one of the shorter races? Oh, for sure. One of the shorter races or for the stage races, as long as people have had kind of comfortable with kind of a marathon distance on um, trails with, with a decent amount of ascent, um, then I'm happy to give them a place. But the, but the, uh, the full 170k ultra isn't really a beginner's one yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> it's probably better to to uh, start, start i don't somewhere. know Lizzie. i think how your career started you lined <laughs> up you know, <laughs> ahead, so maybe. <laughs> it's true yeah <laughs> any trainer tips though for people who are potentially um going to pencil this in um i think really time on your feet um, and just being used to long ascents and descents as well, because what's the longest climb on the route, Lizzie? Um, I think it's about fifteen hundred meters. Yeah. And how high does um, it go? The highest point is actually crossing the glacier um, into Italy, and that's three thousand two hundred meters. So it's a, um, bit, so a little bit higher than UTMB again, too. Isn't yeah, it? and the average, the average the height is higher, than isn't it? it? You get higher, you get, you get more better. climbing, you get to hang with Lizzie. <laughs> I'm much smaller, so it's... it's um, You're not going to get hit with the pole um, just in the start and your eyeballs. <laughs> oh, and there's no lottery or Yay. points required or other you no know, other races that you're required to run to run it. So um, just we only um, ask that you have enough experience that you can keep yourself safe. So we do have a pre-registration, but yeah, no, well, the field no size, running stones required. No. <laughs> can I ask your opinion on the running stones, Lizzie? Are you allowed to, can you, can you, because I've got quite a strong opinion about them, um, which everybody knows. How, how does that make you feel as a previous five-time winner of UTMB and having gone into UTMB before it became um iron man uh how how does it make you feel are you uh in one hand are you sort of pleased that trail running has increased so much in popularity um or does it make you feel slightly that they've sold out um yeah no it's it's great that trail running uh, you know just more people are doing it um i think that's great because it's something that people obviously really need because the more sedentary our lives get, the more um, challenge or time in nature that we need outside of our day to day. And, and trail running kind of helps people to get outside. Um, the way UTMB has gone, well, I probably would have never had the chance to run it had I <laughs> been in. You know what had it been as it is now when i started i guess that leaves a sort of tinge of that, a little bit of sadness doesn't it that's what i said to gary before we started recording this mm. you would never you wouldn't have had the career and journey you've had being somebody they they sort of cutting off that market of somebody turning up and just having that journey 
that amazing we both love that we all love that trail and that they're sort of slightly cutting off but then there's people like you that are developing there's so many other amazing trails and experiences mm. it doesn't have to be at, that's um, what i think i don't dwell on it it's like that that is what it is um there's plenty of other mm. things other things to do especially now since um the covid uh the rise of the fkt even if you're not going to set an fkt you can just go and have a great day for me on the fells and trails in, yeah. in the uk so yeah i yeah i don't and dwell on it <laughs> really that's wow what was racing for me racing was always a curiosity for me um just to see what was possible to see what i could do and sometimes it's nice to do that within a race setting because um, it gives you that focus and, um, you know, you're, you're sharing the experience with so many people, even though it's, it's obviously a very individual sport. Um, but kind of there's a time for everything. So there's a time for racing and then um, a time for just, you know, exploring in, in different ways. Um, and kind of, with UTMR, I just want to give people that opportunity um, to have a, a, a big experience like that in the mountains. Um, maybe they wouldn't go and, go and do something like that on their own, um, uh, simply because it's it's yeah something that I've got so much from over the years is, is time out in the mountains. So, what are the field sizes for the various races? Um, pretty small, especially if you're thinking about UTMB, not, um, which is really nice because it's, it's it now. It's all familiar, <laughs> very familiar. And it's kind of planned so that all the races finish at the same time back in Grechen Brilliant. so that we have a prize giving and closing meal in the evening and all, all the races, um, are kind of back together to enjoy that. So, you know, if you've got friends doing the stage race or you're doing the ultra, um, yeah. It's kind of something for everybody. Um, so the stage race is limited to 200 people, more or less, simply because of the accommodation in the villages, okay. um, particularly on the Italian side. And um, the other races would take sort of two to 300 people um, for, for each one. But yeah, it's, it's pretty small. I love the idea of the stage race then. So if it's a stage I was just going to ask if there's a partner, um, <laughs> is there a pair race? Can we... Uh... No, it's it's a solo race, but um, you can obviously share the accommodation along the way. So I... I oh, I don't want to do that with on, on the registration <laughs> form, people can choose be... who they're sharing with and I make sure that I accommodate them that way in the hotel. So. I think it'd be quite intimate. It's 200 people, max, um, and you're going to move along this course together. I think that is such a mm. wonderful... Uh, Seems to be a really wonderful experience. I heard, um, I remember my teammate, Dan Lawson, he, um, a few years ago, he came over and he's he not a very, he's not a few really experienced trail runner. And he was, he would talked about it with a lot of, um, uh, he loved it, but he was also a bit blown away because he lives on the <laughs> South Downs way by the trail. <laughs> That's how fast people could run on it and yeah. come out in his daps and be like, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I do a couple of training camps in the summertime as well. I'll get, make sure he's on it next time. <laughs> but I think I think I've heard before, Lizzie, you said you probably were performing at your best when you were training back in Cambridge. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. When I was probably running the best in the mountain races in the Alps, I was I was still in Cambridge, so most of my training was along the river. <laughs> on the tow path. You were probably getting a bit more rest in Cambridge because I know what it's like being in the mountains is that like you just spend your every if you're not out all day, you get FOMO. And so <laughs> you're being forced for a little bit of sitting down time in Cambridge. Too. That's a good point. When I come back from the uh, seaside of the lakes, I come back, I feel trashed. But then if you live there, <laughs> you're like literally <laughs> it's every day. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm uh, I'm right in thinking that um all the events, everything is open for entry. People can enter. Yeah, that's right. Registrations are open um oh. till sort of the 18th of July. All right. Um, and we'll yes, share we'd the love links. to welcome some more people. <laughs> yeah, check out the show notes, everybody. And I'm sure we'll share on the Facebook post to uh links to that race. Awesome. What about, can I just ask one, what about your running journey now, Lizzie? Are you, have you still got a competitive um, fire burning? What's sort of your next challenge 
anything that you still want to do? I, well, the competitive fire, I guess, is still there in a way because for me that the competition was always very much inside um kind of wanted to do the best that I could in that moment and for a long long time that became expressed through competition through races um but now my curiosity has shifted so it's it's not so much racing anymore um when I've got a, a period of time it's kind of exploring more sections of the Himalaya Great Himalaya Trail um so going out in Nepal for you know six or eight days at a time without seeing people <laughs> um, so, so it, it's it's kind of shifted to to some exploring and what's yeah, your time in the big, big uh, mountains how much time would you say spend in Nepal over the year um, only allowed to spend five months of the year there. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the, the summertime I'm here, obviously for organizing UTMR, um, and then we'll go out to Nepal in the autumn and springtime for as, as long as I can, basically. Do you still keep one eye on the sort of trail running scene and the athletes or, um, have you stepped out of that completely now? Half, half, I guess. Um, half, half because of UT UTMR, but probably, yeah, I probably wouldn't know a lot of the names anymore. <laughs> um, but yeah, always kind of keeping watch on the trail running races and, and things like that. But, um, yeah, um, my focus has shifted for sure. <laughs> Out of no. all your um, FKTs and podiums and wins and uh, GB vests and anything, everything, all your wonderful accolades of your career, is there one that you are most particularly, maybe proud's not the word, or, or you have the fondest memories of? No, I, I guess it's looking forward rather than looking back. So just enjoying, you know, like being out on the trail today <laughs> and kind of hoping I'll just keep, moving for as long as I can <laughs> yeah <laughs> I hear you taking it day by day rather than thinking about things that have happened that's great advice yeah quick five Eddie I'm not going to ask you if you want to do them I'm doing them this time <laughs> <laughs> you've been fighting over you today Lizzie <laughs> <laughs> so at the end of each interview we have five quick questions you don't have to answer them quickly um i'll try and answer them as quick as possible though so yeah first one here we go your favorite breakfast um a good coffee and a piece of good bread <laughs> good. i'm quite simple in the morning love it well i'm a tea not a coffee <clears throat> would send me a loopy <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine uh, Eddie on coffee. <laughs> uh, is there a race out there? Uh, maybe not to race, but is there a race out there that you'd still like to take part in? Or a route? Or a route, yeah. Probably back in Nepal. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's still holding me there. <laughs> yeah. This one always stumps our guests. Um, the last song you remember listening to? That is a good question. I listen to music and enjoy it, but I don't remember the name. <laughs> <laughs> then when someone so in the car and you're like, I couldn't even know. I can't even. Yeah. 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 So I'm, um, I enjoy what I listen to, but I don't necessarily you know what you that was. To anything when you're running or. No. Yeah. no, I could tell. I the birds. Know. Yeah, the birds. Especially at the moment, they're just yeah, they're, 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 they're the moment, aren't they? singing their hearts out at the moment. They're all trying yeah. to get their partners, aren't they? Chirping away. We don't think like that, Gary. We're just That's enjoying. What doing. <laughs> I thought they're just waking us up. It's just the dawn chorus. Uh, 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 no. <laughs> oh, let's take a lower level. <laughs> One thing that you could not have done without during the Himalayan Trail. 
Um, my satellite tracker, <laughs> except for the first attempt when I did lose that as well. So, oh, wow. how did you um, lose it, Lizzie? How did you lose your tracking? Well, it was really thick jungle forest and kind of 2,000 meters from the river to the top. So different kinds of veg vegetation with the change in altitude. And at this point, I was um, kind of in old growth forest. And you know when the ground just falls away beneath you? I mean, it, it was pretty steep. Um, but, but just So I, I was uh, just kind of falling, I don't know, four to six meters at a time. Oh and um like my water bottles got ripped out the side of my rucksack which meant that then i could only drink or eat when i actually crossed the stream because i didn't have any way of carrying water um and i because i was carrying too much i had another extra sack around my neck um with all the important stuff <laughs> like um the maps compass a satellite tracker, satellite phone, um, diary, camera, money. Um, and I think I probably just put it down to readjust my rucksack at one point. And, you know, because I, I was quite concerned at this point because I was coming down steeply towards um, Himalayan River and realized that there wouldn't be a nice, easy trail along the bank of the river and <laughs> it would just drop straight in. So I was kind of changing my my um my plan about how i was going to get myself out of this situation um and i don't know maybe 20 minutes later i realized i was suddenly feeling really light because i'd suddenly dropped <laughs> a lot yeah. of weight um tried to find it but it, you know it, when you're bushwhacking through shrub that thick you, you never find the same way so i did search for it and never found it so it's probably still sat there yeah. Um, somewhere. Well, that sounds really harrowing. That does, Lizzie. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any bushes with wildlife? I was kind of asking another question here. Sorry, but not during the GHT, but since um, my most interesting time was walking down the Barren River. I was coming out from the Makalu region, um, and it was the beginning of winter already, so partly snow higher up. Um, and I, I saw a bear, it, it crossed in, in front of me, um, not very far away, yeah. and was fo following um, wolf tracks for a while um, that was obviously either injured or carrying something that was dripping blood. Um, and I, I actually, because it, it, it took me a couple of days to walk down, part, part um, down to the kind of main trail at the bottom um i don't think anyone else had passed that way that season just from yeah. how the trail was um and i I, <laughs> I took a wrong step at one point and i actually broke my ankle oh, no. and it took me a day and a half to walk out on it um down to the next village and so i had one night and i slept slept in this sort of clearing um and I, I obviously knew that I couldn't move very fast. And during the night, I could just f hear that the big animals were really close. Oh. Um, and s that's actually the only time that I've been scared on a night when I've been out on my own. Um, and I was thinking, to, <laughs> I wasn't so concerned about my ankle anymore. It was like, if I get through the night and I'm alive, then, yeah. <laughs> then the rest is easy. Um, but I was, yeah, it was, I made it through the night and, <laughs> and made it out. So everything oh, wow. did turn out okay. I was scared yeah, just listening, just imagining. <laughs> Yeah, our second guest have Gary, uh, you scary... wouldn't make it. You wouldn't have made it, Gary. You'd, just, you'd given yourself up to the lions. <laughs> One of our previous guests had a scary wildlife story too. Um, the journey across America. Jamie. Jamie, yes, Jamie McDonald. Yeah, um, he had a few wildlife uh, cougars were quite prevalent mm -hmm. in his in his story. My goodness me, that sounds absolutely terrifying. And you just you know you you said earlier about um, so when you were lost and if you did see a sprain an ankle and how much that would slow you down. But then this time mm -hmm. around, yes, you did. Obviously, I did. Yeah, break. and it did oh. slow me down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was I was just lucky with the way that it broke that I could still put weight on on it in one direction. 
Yeah. Any, anyone listening to this who's going to DNF for a small hamster <laughs> local 50k, I would like you to channel dodgy tummy. <laughs> dodgy tummy just the, this is the thing, though. There's there's no way of DNFing because you have to get yourself <laughs> out and down. So wow, amazing. Things you missed from the UK. Marmite. Marmite. <laughs> you know what I really miss at this time of year is the hot cross bun. Hot cross bun. Well, you won't though because no, well, I still marmite. <laughs> if, if you come to England, they sell hot cross buns pretty much all year round now. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, How often do you go back to the UK now, Lizzie? Um, probably twice a year. Um, to see family, it it just depends. Um. Yeah, I mean, I don't have any anything to do there anymore, kind of thing. So work work is here, and then I'm I'm as much time as I can be in Nepal. So it's it's just going back to visit family. Have you got any of your family to come over and do the races or to help out? Oh, to help out, yeah, come and volunteer, but not to run. <laughs> come on, Aniki. <laughs> I've got one last yeah. question. Sorry, I didn't ask this earlier, but I'm not too sure if it is or do you think it will ever become an FKT, the, the Great Himalayan Trail, or if it's even possible to become an FKT? Um, quite of the opinion that it's impossible to become an FKT simply because um, there is no one set route and how you, you cannot compare... Um, starting points that are, you know, separated by an 8,000 meter mountain or something like that. Um, so for me, what's important is you, you state your route and the style that you're doing it in. Cause obviously if you're doing it alone is very different to if you're doing it either in a pair or, yeah. you know, people meeting you at different points. Um, so kind of just state what your route is state, the way that you're doing it and anybody that knows those mountains will just respect you for yeah. um you know whatever whatever it is you've you've done and it's it's really there even more than anywhere else it's really about the make, making the journey um and the experience it gives you yeah so um yeah that, i think that's my <laughs> my answer for the phd <laughs> So, well, I think that's a great place to end uh, our chat. Thanks for thanks for your time, dear Lizzie. I've re I've really enjoyed that. Apologies, Rex is going bar me in the background. I'm not too sure if you he can hear him. He's got a question for Lizzie. Oh my <laughs> goodness me! I think the postman's about to arrive. <laughs> Apologies Thank for that. you so much for sharing a very small part of your running journey, but also all about your wonderful time in Nepal and. Um, and the race and we will yeah i think lots of people that perhaps were disappointed that utmb wasn't for them this year or one of the other one of the other races and perhaps it was going to get be signed up to get into one of those races in the future here is another adventure which sounds um wow less people um, a wilder route and um and an amazing adventure so go and check that out yeah best of luck with everything Lizzie. thank you so much thank you and thank you so much for having me on it's been lovely chatting to you yeah. so great Good. thank you so much thanks take care bye bye you too bye well, i enjoyed that eddie uh, again another titan from our sport steve birkinshaw lizzie hope um and what was you know years ago i talked about the keswick mountain festival earlier and um the first time i i knew about lizzie hawker but she was doing a, a, a she was a guest speaker at the keswick mountain festival so that's uh, it was great to listen to her experiences then but that was like oh goodness me like 2016 or something like that so a few a few years ago but uh, the great himalayan trail that just sounds Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Oh, what a journey that is. What a journey. Upcoming races. We've got the Edale Skyline Fell Race. Oh, it's a Category A race. 20 miles, unmarked course covering high and exposed fell terrain. Potentially harsh conditions. Though I think the weather's pretty good by the looks of it, by everyone's yeah. pictures in the UK at the moment. You have to have suitable experience required and be able to demonstrate this or your place will be cancelled. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Uh, so you're only allowed to go up if you are uh, experienced. I don't think people probably sign up for that if they weren't. Category A, it's like... Wah, wah, wah. Eh, <laughs> eh, 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 eh. Bring your helmet. Unmarked. <laughs> it's like... Unmarked. <laughs>
<laughs> that is that, that, yeah that would be quite nice Sign you up, what, Gary. yeah yeah i think it'd be awesome I mean, edian skyline again you should be doing this edit so i'll uh spine yeah. territory uh yeah i do fancy that i'm not too sure if i would qualify for a category ear fell race um if, I'd, if, if I'd you had all day you'd be fine yeah i would like the cut off is actually but no yeah it sounds that <laughs> sounds awesome next up uh is a local race to me the hard one's 55 um that is oh my goodness gisborough to helmsley i've done this one twice twice or three times the so place one year didn't you gary no that was the hundred and no uh joint third or joint fourth or something like that oh yeah i did oh goodness me was that no, I think I was. He's trying to. He's trying to, he's trying to pretend he's forgotten. Oh, uh, wait. Uh, let me I've see. I've never individually. I've never done like a third place individually. But I think the Grand Slam, the accumulation of all the races. I think. I well, put them all together. I think I was sixteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you can. <laughs> but the Hardmore's fifty-five for me. I think that's probably my favourite Hardmore's uh, route. I do enjoy the sixty and the hundred and ten when it takes you down the course line. But I just love that part of the the moors um, from Gisborough over to Helmsley. Are you going to go and give them a cheer? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> but yeah, best of luck to everybody taking part in the Hormones 55 and everybody else who's torn, torn the line this weekend. Hold on tight if you're doing the Adele Skyline. What have you got coming up, Eddie? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get rid of the dry, uh, the dry mouth and the take it easy, take it easy. We've got, um, yeah, just build back into this week. And uh, I've already ticked off one strength session. Uh, I put on some good tunes. I lifted some big weights. I, on, I Tell me what your tunes are. No way. That ah. is personal information. No, do you know, I put on the UK. I felt really cool. I, I put my Spotify on. And I was like, what should I listen to? And it was like a UK top. 100 most listened to songs oh my god i was like this is who listens to this so much swearing and i was like these are these aren't songs these are something that would come from my 11 year olds <laughs> earphones um but some of them were good uh i've already ticked off one weight session um i i i don't i apart from the squat rat which is in front of the mirror i don't do my weights normally um looking at myself but Flex. i was just one in the gym so i set up my little weight stations back from the mirror so that i could do it and i'd do my like single leg squat oh my god if you ever want to feel like if you're feeling a bit down you're coming back from a bit of a nasty cold and i watched myself doing single leg squats in the mirror it was a low point in yeah. my personal <laughs> journey i was like oh my god <laughs> so horrendous um uh, need some work on my single leg squats also um so i just will yeah I'll, I'll do a couple more gym sessions to supplement um get back into um training i will try i'm gonna try and do my long run but again when you've had your, when your immune system's taken a bit of a battering i don't want to then go and just absolutely destroy myself so i'm just going to take each day as it goes if i feel up for a bit more intensity i'll do the first bit on the bike to protect the old yeah. lungs when it's a bit warmer um and it's hope... hard to know isn't it we're not always hard but sometimes when you're coming back it's like am i just feeling a bit lazy yeah. or am i really yeah feeling... sometimes when you get step out it's like oh this is so nice yeah. why would i ever go the dog walks <laughs> Why will I ever go back? So I, at some point, I'm sure I'll get a nudge from coach. I think we could uh, put that heart rate up a little bit. Now, you, do, we'll uh, you said about single leg squats. Can you do a pistol squat? You, well, I was doing pistol squats in my warm up. Um, oh. Whoop whoop. Um, so what I tend to do is I do them. I start with them on the TRX to like get the movement because right. I find that the hardest bit. So I can go on holding the TRX. I can do a full really good, and then I do them without the TRX. Oh, I can do them, but they're I find them um, very very hard and challenging. A lot of it is technique. Um, yes, I think a lot of it. Yeah, let, let's say it's technique, <coughs> rather, yeah, than, technique. Uh, <laughs> rather than strengths. Um, so, yeah, what about you? Same again, and repeat last week, really. Uh, walking, maybe a little bit of jogging with the dogs, working back, um, do my strength and do the bike. And I'm hoping for a trip to the lakes but it is mother's day isn't it, this weekend so i don't want to be in the we, don't, we have a different in france they do they don't do it at the same um in the, the same sunday so it's ignored 
But if I do do it, I think I'm aiming for the far eastern fells again. The thing with these Wainwrights are, um, if you're not careful and you miss one off, you like literally, oh goodness me, I've got to go all the way back over there for for one Wainwright. So I'm going to try and do batches of four. Names. I know a guy that's done a really good map. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> send him a text. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, we know where he lives now yeah i could, <laughs> could bother him <laughs> but um i'm yeah. gary from the podcast <laughs> <laughs> oh god it's so swat. cringe when i think i said that to somebody <laughs> you're gonna have a t-shirt soon i know oh, it. okay from the podcast yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh come on can't pause myself so yes far eastern fails and i'm thinking um oh is it mardale head Horse water and anybody who's been there they, you know there's no coffee shop at the finish or a pub but it's like literally in and amazed out amazed you're going there yeah well you've got to otherwise that is <laughs> yeah i'll be quite sad you know what i went to a pub in pooley bridge afterwards and i want sorry on saturday i was waiting for my friend to finish and i went to a pub i'm not going to mention it but i wanted a little i remember this pub years ago and it was a pub and you could go in you could have i could read my book read lizzie hawker's book um and have a pint and have something to eat I went in there and it was like a big restaurant now and I was like, well, I'm dirty. I'm pretty, pretty scummy. And I, I was sitting in this restaurant and all the families were there eating their Sunday lunch and stuff like that and I just felt, oh, this isn't right. Business that though, isn't it? Sunday yeah. lunch is probably their biggest, uh, they don't want some grubby old tramp coming in. There was nobody sitting in the corner. It was all restaurant. It was, it would change. Yeah. So yeah, over to Mark, fingers crossed. We'll see if I can get over there. It's probably about 50 50 at the moment. But yeah, more of the same. Knee will improve again for another week. And I think um I do want to go and see the new Batman, actually. So I'll see how that if we can What? What the know. new Batman? <laughs> you, you don't even you're 11. <laughs> oh no, this is a 15 certificate. So this is why it's quite tricky because one of my children isn't uh allowed to go and see it. So whether we'll go and see it or not is a is a it's a 15. It must be because they don't mark, mark, grade. What's the word? It must be not very nice. Why would you, like, why would you make a Batman that's 15? It's quite dark, isn't it, Batman? Joke, I don't joke. know. To be honest, I haven't, I don't watch that sort of thing, Gary. If it's not keeping up with the Kardashians, below deck. I'm not <clears throat> I penciled in um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre with my daughter. Oh, my God. <laughs> she really wants to watch it. No, stop it. Yeah, yeah. We're very similar as me and I. So, yeah, that's it for me, my week. In- well, wait for the Batman review. We were thinking we're going back to England in a few weeks and we were thinking about taking the kids to the cinema because obviously our kids don't... Um, uh, but yeah, tricky to 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 accommodate an audience of an age range from six yeah. to 12 plus the mother that scares easy. Eddie, you never guess what? What? Another five-star review we've got Gary, a few actually yeah they've been flooding in yeah, it's embarrassing <laughs> maybe, they did. maybe they were there all along and i just couldn't find <laughs> yeah maybe that uh, anyway we don't need to uh... <laughs> uh, but this week's shout out goes to bolivian andy via apple podcast great britain on the do you want to tell the story behind bolivian andy who is now one of our bffs even though we don't know yeah him. well bolivian andy andy i know andy um local running community and he was the marshal at the cross country who gave me a double shout out one of the hills and then gary um at the annick uh final fixture for the harry league so we then great. mentioned them on the podcast and then yes. he came on the facebook group and went it's me, it's me. Andy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah he's left a wonderful review it's quite long so bear with me people uh oh, since <laughs> run of the hills a weekly hit since lockdown happened and working from home kicked in in march 20 i found myself looking forward to this brilliant podcast every week i seriously wonder if i'm slightly addicted i've even taken to shouting out gary across country events I'll have it playing on my iPad next to the laptop screen every Friday when it's aired. The hosts, Edwina and Gary, are super knowledgeable. Edwina is super knowledgeable. Have a great rapport, <laughs> Eddie. Can't fake it. Um, and uh, excellent guests. And me being based in the northeast of England, like Gary, loving the fells and trails and being as aspiring Bob Graham rounder. Sorry, Eddie. Uh, she, he does love your rant. 
and having a place in the UTMB 2022. Oh, wowzers. Oh, uh, Andy, it was all going so well. <laughs> Give me a bib. Give me a bib. I'll be you for a day. <laughs> it feels like the show covers tons of issues that are relevant for him. Um, if those things aren't your bag, don't worry. There's enough in the show to cover all areas. Results, kit, training, nutrition, and bags more. All done with real enthusiasm, ethics, and managed to comfort a real love or what the hosts do and have fun at the same time. <gasps> oh, thank you very much. Keep going. Uh, oh, please keep going for a long time. All the best, Andy Stevenson. Wowzers, what a review. Thanks so much, Andy, for I listening just, and well, taking the time. I think we should, uh, I might print that off, put it on my fridge. Yeah, that could be my um, profile thing on Facebook. <laughs> That. <laughs> that's awesome you know people i love it um and we make light of this but people spend the time to listen and then to leave a review it's it's, it's uh, i appreciate it i appreciate it so much thanks very much okay so bear with me while i explain this in my um slightly um plague state so this month Chia charge are giving away a jar of peanut butter if you spend 35 pounds or more as we discussed at the beginning of the show the peanut butter is totally addictive once you've once you've popped, what's the saying? Once you've popped, you can't stop. Um, so we thought alongside that, we would do a little uh, picture competition, but not our normal, you know, pretty trail, that sort of picture. We're going to go, we want to see your breakfasts. That's when I consume my main amount of peanut butter. That's the link. It's tentative, but that's the link we're looking for. So my uh, my breakfast is a doll. I have the, I've had the same breakfast for nigh on maybe like 35 years of toast Amen. and peanut butter and jam that is my breakfast I'll, I'll, but I'll still send you a picture um you can see my terrible spreading and the ratio so I will be looking at this sort of thing ratio of peanut butter to jam so what we'd like to see is a picture of your pre or post run uh breakfast um uh and the we're gonna have two winners winners gonna be chosen at 5th of april we just want to see your food basically yeah. what do you it have, doesn't to, have to include peanut butter it doesn't just general oh, no sorry it was a heavy peanut butter intro but <laughs> obviously some people don't have peanut butter for breakfast it's just um is that like jam it. and peanut is that your favorite peanut butter combo App. Mm, but sometimes gary i won't lie i go peanut butter honey not for breakfast though that's more like a tea, tea time treat i i think a lot of it is to do with the fact that i just in the morning just am trying to survive so there's no i literally put those two pieces of toast in the toaster have a cup of tea and spread them while shouting at children just just, just brush your teeth just brush your teeth Stop kicking that football inside. I'll put a post up on Facebook on Friday and uh, yeah, take a picture of your uh, breakfast and we will choose our top two on the 5th of April and we're going to enjoy seeing these so much yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. That's a wrap, Eddie. Episode That's 82, done and dusted. Wow, well, that was a good day. catch up. I enjoyed that. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for the five-star reviews and thanks again to Chia Charge for sponsoring the show. My name's Gary Twitz. I'm Eddie Sutton. And let's run to the hills. <laughs>